I, first off, I'd like to thank you guys for coming. Uh, I know that my background isn't in tactical, so I, I could see a lot of people being like, well, I want to listen to this guy. He's you know, he never served in the military. He doesn't work with military people directly, fire, you know, police. Uh, so I'd like to thank you for coming. Um, what I have done is worked with velocity-based training for 18 years now. I know some people like to write a book after doing something for six months or a year, and yes, I have written books on the topic, but you know, I think I've done this for, for quite some time. Uh, the muscle fiber is no different in an athlete than it is in a tactical operator. The muscle fiber is no different in an aging, per well, in a little bit, you lose some of the elastin whenever you get into the, the aging property. But, you know, things are not truly different. So I look at a lot of the military research. I look at a lot of different research whenever we're doing these things. But we're going to look at overview of large and small team implementation. Why, do, why am I going about it this way? Well, uh, some of you guys might work with huge amounts of people at any given time. I've heard about some of the people having, you know, 100, 200, 300 operators that they work with. I've heard of some people who only work with 12. So over the evolution of the past you know, 16, 17 years, I've looked at it a couple of different ways. So I want to make sure that you guys have the tools to do it in either way that you want to do it, okay? So what is VBT? What, Velocity-based training is basically, all it is is it uses a device that calculates velocity and calculates power, okay? That's it. There's a lot of different devices that do that. Uh, so the methods and how they calculate it, basically, well, there's three main systems. And I only put two of them up here. There's a camera-based system. Okay, that's, they use the reference point, you know, kind of like dart fish, right? You've got your reference point. You know if the bar moves, you know, this much on the screen, it moved 18 inches or whatever it happens to be. And then it uses a time stamp uh, for however many milliseconds, however many hertz it records at, and it uses that to give you a velocity. Then there's the linear position transducer, and it's my favorite, right? It's my favorite because uh, it's basically a stopwatch and a tape measure. It's always right. It's always right. You know, you'll hear me many times say I'd rather be right than lucky uh, because I've been to Vegas before and I didn't know how to, you know, do something that Dr. Alvar is going to teach me how to do. And I lost all of my money in about 30 minutes. So I'm not lucky. I would always rather be right. Then there's accelerometers, which is a combination of the accelerometer, the gyroscope, and sometimes a magnetometer. It uses algorithms to detect the start and the stop, but uses algorithms to detect uh, what the bar path should be. Okay, and it, so it's got a lot of prediction stuff on there, so sometimes you get a little bit of funny numbers because it's predicting, right? It's not directly, it's not the stopwatch and tape measure. It's trying to figure out what should happen, okay? So with, whenever you've got predi uh, prediction, there is some measurement issue. Um, that, it, that's just the way that it is. But now whenever you get an accelerometer that's accurate, now, Jay Dawes just posted a video uh, the other day. It had an, two different accelerometer-based units and a, a linear position transducer. One of the accelerometer-based units was right on point within 0 0.02 meters per second of the LPT. The other unit was all over the place. So realize that whenever I'm saying this, it's, it's dependent on the, the unit that it's actually measuring what it's supposed to measure. Okay, I'm going to leave names of companies out of this, right? Uh, but they may be different. They might always be the same, okay? But they, it's not inaccurate. So what I'm saying here is everything that I'm gonna talk about with the zones, uh, some of the peak velocities and things like that, those are based off of the linear position transducer, okay? So if you go and you've got a accelerometer that attaches to the bar or the body, it's giving completely different numbers. As long as it's reliable, there's things that you can do to make it work, okay? And we'll go over that later. Okay, we'll go over that as a part of this. Because I know that some, uh, I know like Joe Dink, one of the things that he told me is they've got uh, a, an LPT that they use in the weight room, but when they're sending the guys out to wherever they're going to be for a while, they send them out, with, they want to send them out with an accelerometer because it's cheaper and it'll fit in a bag. It's not this big bulky thing. So there's some things that we can do to, to match them up a little bit. But before we go any further, one of the things that I want to address is that we have to realize that there's four main ways that the muscle cell, the muscle fiber, produces force within the series elastic component. The first way is with the myofibril adaptations. Okay? The myofibril, you can you know, work with doing uh, resistance training to make it bigger. You can improve the strength of the actin, uh, the uh, actin and myosin link, the myosin head pulling on the uh, heavy chain on the actin. Uh, 
there's then the size principle, of course, and this is a neurological. And the size principle, Heinemann size principle, this is why you lift heavy weights, so that you can preferentially recruit high threshold motor units, okay? So that you can turn the big stuff on, the forceful stuff on faster, preferentially you recruit it. Okay, then there's rate coding. And rate coding is how the muscle cell works within itself, within its coordination, and how the muscle fibers work together within the muscle, the individual muscle, like all one fiber within the hamstrings versus all the fibers in the hamstrings versus the hamstrings with the glutes, the low back, the quads, and how everything syncs together, okay? Now, this is the, ma this is the major one that velocity-based training does. It doesn't hit all the others, and it definitely doesn't hit the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And how that adaptation is, is that it improves in the speed of ability to uh, release and reabsorb calcium, okay? And that is what unlocks the troponin which allows the tropomyosin to move so that the myosin head can come on and that's how the contraction happens. Okay, so why do I go over this and spend so much detail on this part? Uh, of course, we've got the parallel elastic component, which is fascia, sarco, uh, not the sarcoplasm, whatever that is around the sarcolemma, okay, sarcolemma, uh, the collagen matrix, and all other tissues that lie in parallel to the muscle fiber that pull. So we, I'm not discounting those. There's just some of the areas like with the fascia that I don't completely understand, so I don't want to stand up here and talk about it, but I want to say that it's there. I want to talk about that this is only part, right? Only part of it. Why do I say that? Because I have had several people who said and have shown me programs where every single exercise was based off of velocity. I think that is a mistake. Why do I think that's a mistake? Because that's only 25% of the means that the muscle produces force. So if I'm only, you know, people need to eat, they need to sleep, they need to drink water, and they need to breathe. Guess what? What happens if I only do one of those? I'm gonna die. I'm going to die. We need to remember that we've gotta have a balanced approach. Some people will look at studies and try and apply that to training, and you should apply it to training, but you shouldn't just go wholeheartedly in with it because with research, we only look at one small thing to see if it makes a difference, right? It's not saying that this is the best program in the world, just do this one tiny little thing. That's ridiculous, okay? Now, let's look into the integration. Now, the, the large team integration, this is what I'm well known for with the zones and things. Why do we do it this way? Because we know that, and we'll see here in a little bit, that the slopes are pretty similar, the velocities are pretty similar, and if I've got 40 to 60 people in there at a time, and that's on the small end, right? With my track and field teams, there's 120 people on our track and field team. We have men and women at the same time. Swimming and diving was over 100 people. You know, with football, it was 40 to 60 people on the floor at the same time with several different coaches. Being able to keep that many people on the same page, Ain't going to happen with individualization. But what we could do is use uh, velocity zones. The feedback will aid in coaching and it will encourage competitiveness on the floor, and we'll get to those. Now, what I want to also show here is the effectiveness of it. And this is based off of a, uh, this next slide is something I presented at NSCA National last year. And this is four years of our data on average, okay? So we were really fortunate that it was, uh, I know a lot of people leave the college sector to go to the tactical sector because of the increased stability. We were very, very fortunate. We had one of those runs of 16 years that we had data for. 16 years, that doesn't happen very often. Okay, so we had 16 years worth of data. So we averaged it out and we looked at the, what I'm referring to as traditional type training, what I'm referring to as levels. Where the traditional type training is what we did from 2000 till 2006-ish, I think. I'm getting old and I haven't had enough caffeine, so, you know, the crutch, I tore my meniscus, I'm getting old, that's, that's all the only thing the crutch is for, I'll probably have to get back on it here in a little bit, but, you know, I don't want Robin to have to try and Photoshop a crutch out of here for the whole talk, so, you know, she says Photoshop's the F word, so, she said I'm allowed to use my F word or hers, okay, so, the levels of utilizing VBT, the y-axis is percentage change in watts produced as found by counter-movement jump, and x-axis is the year that they were in the program. Okay, so we see this blue line, the traditional training, they shot up for a year from one to two, then they flatlined on how they produce power. We see with the velocity-based training, with the red, they shoot up up until the third year and then flatline for the fourth. 
So we have an additional two years of development. Okay? Now thinking about the University of Missouri, and this is back before we entered the SEC, we were a team that always got out recruited, but somehow we would manage to win the Big 12 North and that sometime we were actually ranked number one in the country for a while. It wasn't because of our recruiting, it's that we got the additional development. Okay? Now, the traditional training, some people are like, all right, so you guys sucked at training. You only got power improvements for a year. You guys are obviously horrible. Well, let's look at this. Study by Bert Jacobson with Rob Glass. They improved power for a year with, as absolute strength increased. Years two, three, and four, absolute, continued, absolute strength continued to improve. Speed and power did nothing. Same thing was found at uh, Texas A&M. Mike Clark was on the paper. Unfortunately, I do not remember the first author. University of Dayton found the same thing with their athletes. Okay, guys, this is not uncommon. Okay? We're chasing after strength, but we weren't seeing improvements in power. Now, the VBT zones, the utilization of them led to far greater outputs than traditional training for power. Uh, the VBT zones are effective in large team settings. Your three to four plateau. Why did it plateau? Well, could it have been that we needed to switch up to speed strength from strength speed? And maybe we needed to go to a snatch instead of a clean? Possibly. Possibly. That could have stimulated further adaptations. Was it that we needed to change the methods altogether? Go to something completely different than what we were doing? Quite possible. I'm never going to know the answer to that. Why am I never going to know? Well, it's kind of like uh, how Bill Kramer refers to UConn. You know, Camelot is lost. You know, we know the, the strength and conditioning program, the football program are completely different now. We can't go back and try and make those sorts of changes. Okay, now how does VBT help? Well, one way, the major way, is through the uh, SED principle. The SED principle is specific adaptations to impose demands. So you know exactly what trait you're trying to develop, and you train specifically for that. Okay? Uh, absolute strength is below 0.5 meters per second. Accelerative strength is 0.5 to 0.75. Strength speed is 0.75 to 1.0. Speed strength is 1.0 to 1.3. Starting strength is over 1.3 meters per second. Now, this is for the big rock exercises. What do I mean by big rock exercises? Well, squat, bench, and deadlift. Why are they the big rock exercises? That's the ones that we focused on at Mizzou. We did have Olympic lifts, and we did those as well, utilizing peak velocity, and the ranges of motion were so different that we couldn't just give those one set guideline because it was just way too far off. We're talking like 0.7s and one meter per second difference versus 0.06 to 0.1, right? For me, it's good enough. For me, it's good enough. Now, the slopes are not significantly different and this is from my own work on something that we're uh, going to be presenting. Hopefully it gets accepted at uh, NSCA National with Division I hockey players. So please don't take a picture of this or tweet it out or anything. If you want to take a picture, that's fine. Don't tweet it out. But basically what we've got here is the top line, this dotted line, is trap bar deadlift. The bottom line, the solid line, is bench press. These are done not in a Smith machine. And these are done with Division I athletes who are highly trained. Okay? We see... Is the slope slightly different? Yep. If we go all the way back to like negative 20% of 1RM, they might intersect. But guess what? Who can do negative 20% of 1RM? Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Is it completely precise? No, it's not. And I'm going to be the first one to say it. Is it completely in implementable? Could you take this and go do it tomorrow? Yes. Whereas some people want to give you a different slope and a different range and everything for a bench press versus an incline versus a you know front squat back. Well, front squat's going to be a little bit different. And the, I always defend the front squat. Like I always say, do not use velocity on a front squat. And the reason why is if you do max velocity, max intended velocity, whenever you're coming up on a front squat and you're trying hard to get that reading to go up as high as it can, that barbell may or may not fly off of your shoulders, kick to in the bottom of the chin, have blood gush everywhere, bite off part of your tongue, nearly get knocked out, and then have to have a beard for the rest of your life because you didn't have health insurance to be able to go get stitches because the emergency room visit's like 500 bucks right off the bat, right? That may or may not have actually happened. <laughs> but with uh, VBT, right? There's, it's basically the way that you can quantify and differentiate traits. And there's no other way that you can differentiate them between strength, speed, and speed, strength, right? 
Why do I say it that way? Well, even with the old Bosco strength continuum that some people refer to, uh, where they fi found that 0 to 15% of 1RM was neurological, right? That was, you were blessed by the hand of God with whatever speed, that, how fast you could move that. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't trainable. 15 to 40% was starting strength. 40 to 60 was non-quantifiable. 60 to 80% was accelerative strength. And 80 to 100 was absolute strength. And I think that that's, those are pretty well something that we can all agree upon. Now, where the non-quantifiable comes in is the strength, speed, and speed strength. They knew that it was power, right? There's definitely power that occurs in that zone. And if you look even at the NSCA text, it will talk about between 30 and 60% for more of the traditional exercises. 80% for the Olympic lifts is where peak power typically occurs. Well, there's two sides to that coin. There's strength, speed, and speed strength. How do we know that? It was independently found by Roman in his book, The Training or the Management of the Weightlifter. Uh, then there was also stuff by Verhoshansky referring to these traits, Bondarchuk referring to these traits, and most recently, Jadovsev, uh, Jindaka, I'm sorry, Jindaka. And he talked about load velocity and velocity load. He's a Swedish Nordic. Um, if somebody is in there, you know, from that region, you'll probably tell me I'm saying his name completely wrong, and I think I say my own name completely wrong sometimes, so I'm not surprised. Uh, but we know that there is the, uh, we've got those two specific traits that are the two sides, the power coin, right? Now, how we came up with things like, you know, speed strength, and Olympic lifts are supposed to develop speed strength. They're speed strength by nature. It is not necessarily the strongest person who wins the Olympic lifting meet. It is the person who can express force the most rapidly, okay? And that's one of the great things about the Olympic lifts and why they transfer so well into sport and into some other means. Like I know that uh, what Martin's gonna be talking about later is how speed can save your life in the tactical, uh, tactical area. So, you know, speed is definitely needed for the tactical operator. Now, has anybody heard the story on Olympic lifts from Mizzou? Show of hands, who's heard it? Okay, two people. All right, I'm going to be brief on this. This is how we really came into utilizing velocity significantly. I had done it starting in 1999, right? I know because I couldn't buy a beer at the hotel bar, so I, it had to be 99, or it was 2000 before I turned 21. It's one of the two, okay? In 2006, I'm doing, uh, 2004, 2005, 2005. Yeah, it's 2006. I had just gotten started my PhD program and I had just started as a full time strength conditioning coach. You know, so I want to turn over a new leaf. I'm a, I'm a tr horrendous procrastinator. You can ask Matt on whenever I get my reviews into him, and it's like supposed to be done at midnight. It gets in at 11.59.59. But I was still under the deadline, except for on one, because I completely forgot about it. Okay? Uh, so I wanted to turn over this new leaf and not procrastinate. So we were supposed to do a paper on a mini thesis on something that we cared about, and we cared about deeply, so that it wouldn't be a hard thing to write a 25-page paper on, only 25 pages, for a, a semester project for my regression analysis class. So I thought to myself, and I'm like, well, I want to do this on something in the weight room, something that's meaningful. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to write this paper about how cleans are related to vertical jump. Cleans are Olympic lifts. They're explosive exercises. We measure explosive strength and explosive power through the vertical jump. So my improvement in clean should be related to my improvement in vertical jump. And this way, whenever this paper is due, I'm just on back-to-back -back road trips out to California. So I'm not going to have time to, you know, write a lot of the stuff for it because the, that would be the appropriate statistic. I believe it was called a logistic backwise step right, backward stepwise regression. One of those two guys would be able to tell you if that's right or not. I made it through stats. I farm those things out. Okay. Basically, the long story short is uh, we learned how to do it that night. I go over, I plug in my little flash drive. You know, we, I don't want to forget how to do it. And then I run the data and I find that there was no relationship, okay? No relationship. So I call somebody far smarter than me, have her come over. I was single, she was hot. You know, I was trying anything I could. And she came over to the stats lab at 11 o'clock at night. I probably had a chance until I was, you know, just stupid, but that's okay. Uh, but uh, she found the same thing as I did. So obviously she wasn't as smart as I thought she was. So then I take it to Dr. Osterlin because there's no way that the clean is not related to the vertical jump. I mean, it's in the, Freaking NSCA essentials. It's in the essentials, right? How the cleans improve explosive ability. 
So there's no way that these stats are right. So I go, I take it with Dr. Osterlin. The guy has got degrees in statistics from Princeton, Stanford, Princeton, and Yale. And Princeton and Yale, they might be switched, okay? I don't remember what, but Stanford was his bachelor's. Looks like Beaker, completely brilliant. He wrote the testing for intelligence in the state of Missouri that everybody has to take whenever they're going through an elementary education. He runs it, finds the same thing. Okay, I can't hold on anymore. I can't hold on to this. So we've got to step back and figure out what's going on. Why is this thing that is supposed to be improving our explosive abilities, why is it not doing it? We had to step back and look, and I had to take that to Coach Ivy, and that's a whole other story. I'll tell at the bar later on. Because uh, Robin told me that I'm not allowed to use profanity, so she, she won't have to edit it out. I didn't do it. Uh, is that Robin back there waiting to see if I'm actually saying something? Uh, but basically, whenever you get down to it, we had to step back and look. And as a function of our program, right, our head football coach wanted numbers. And if you don't hit these certain targets for PR percentages and these certain groups of numbers, these clubs of numbers, he will fire you and get somebody in who will. That's the way that if for those who haven't been in Division I athletics, that's not uncommon. Okay, so what did our cleans... We all know what a clean's supposed to look like, right? You know, you pop it up fast, drop underneath it. I, my technique would suck anyways. I'm definitely not squatting down on this uh, torn meniscus. What did ours look like? Whenever we stepped back and looked, what well, kind of looked like a nasty RDL back extension, reverse curl with a lateral lunge and a limbo kind of thrown in there, right? It wasn't truly a clean. So if we want to look back at the said principle, we know that from the work from Roman, that on a mean velocity should be moving at 1.25 meters per second. For the height of our guys, it should have probably been more like 1.6 to 1.7 meters per second. Whenever we threw it through the tendo on the first time, we saw that the bar was moving 0.65 meters per second. Okay? So this goes back to the old adage with the said principle, right? Specific adaptations to impose demands. We thought we were imposing a demand of speed strength. We were really who knows where. Right? Who knows where? But it goes back to the old adage. You can wish in one hand, poop in the other, and see which one's going to fill up first. Okay? Now, that being said, we did start utilizing velocity on that. We got the football coach to buy in on it. That if they didn't hit the minimum threshold velocity, they could have stood up with the late weight and everything. It could have been 700 pounds they stood up with. It didn't count if they didn't cross the minimum threshold velocity. Okay, so that helped us to refine technique, and that helped us to have one other criterion reference to move away from the thought of just the load and do the cleans for how they should be done. Okay? Now, talked about that already. Let's move on into here. Why do you need velocity-based training? Well, we've got to realize that getting stronger is only part of the equation. It is not everything. Can you lift a heavy weight slow? No, you can't. Okay? You move it as fast as you can. However, the, that is looking at the myofibrillar adaptation of Heinemann size principle. We've still got rate coding to go. Expressing force quickly may be more important than strength down the line. You must absolutely have strength as the foundation, as we'll show here in a pyramid in a little bit. After you have the requisite strength, for males it seems to be about double body weight. This is what I've seen in our own data over 15 years. Uh, Succamel, Memphis, and Stone just came out with a review over a bunch of their uh, uh, studies finding about the same thing. Double body weight squat, power, you know, power goes up at that point. You get over double body weight squat, it levels off. Okay? However, I will say that whenever we in included velocity, we would have guys that could continue to improve strength and they would still improve power. We had one guy that was up at about a 3.5 times body weight while he was still concurrently using velocity. Do jump 46 inches, 6'5", led the nation in receiving yards his senior year. Dude was a freak, okay? Is it going to be that way for everybody? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Uh, but it goes back to the said principle, transfer of trainness. You know, one of the things that I, uh, you know, at Bompa, he always says that all strengths relate back to absolute strength, and that's true for a time. We proved that with our own data. During the first year, strength improved, so did power. After that, it didn't. So I think that strength has got limitations. Now, is it the well? Yep, it is the well. You can go back to the well, you want to have a full well. But if I want to get you know, my water going to all these different places too, I'm going to need to use irrigation. 
Here is an adaptation from uh, Kramer's Gatorade Sports Science 53. Basically, what we're trying to show over here is that if you're looking at maximal force, heavy resistance strength training is obviously key. However, sport deals with impulse forces. Okay, impulse forces, I believe the longest impulse force that we've got in a sporting activity is a golf swing, and that's 250 milliseconds. You're only producing force for 250 milliseconds. Everything else is momentum. Okay? Uh, if you want to look at sprinting, ground contact time, anywhere between 64 and 77 milliseconds, that's how much time you have to produce force into the ground to cause propulsion. Everything has got to be very, very brief and very, very rapid to cause further power adaptations in sport. We see in this chart that at this 200 millisecond time, which seems to be the cutoff for most sporting activities, at that point, explosive ballistic strength training is king. Okay? So doing squat jumps with 30%, doing med ball throws, right? it's going to have a greater adaptation at that point. But that's not to say you don't need absolute strength. You need to develop that first and then come in later with the power and special strengths, as we see right here. Okay? We've got base strength and absolute strength below the specific strength, but you also need to have work capacity and mobility. You need to be able to have the, uh, uh, you need to be able to get into position, okay, thank you, uh, to be able to do the exercises. You need to be in good enough shape to be able to accumulate volume, okay? Now, I put this up here and I can't see it. I don't know if you guys can. I can't read that. Is it the fact that I, Brent, do I need glasses or is this that it's blurry? All right, damn, okay. Well, for those of you that can read it, you can see that there's three exercises on here that have velocity numbers. And then you'll see over here that there's a split jerk and a hang snatch. Okay? I want to point that out. Why do I want to point that out? VBT is an end all. It's a great tool, but it's not the end all be all. Okay? If I had three exercises with VBT on, two of them. We needed to focus on technique before we would do the velocity. Why? Because if your technique sucks, what are you reinforcing? Crap. You're reinforcing crap. The technique needs to be dialed in. Okay, squat, bench, and squat, jump. I think that's what the three exercises I had velocities on. No, I think it might have been clean. Yeah, whatever. Three exercises. Had them on there. They had money technique. The other two, the technique sucked, no velocity. Work on technique first. Sounds good. He can read it. What is it? Hang shrug, hang clean, and squat jump? Go. Okay. Those are the three that we had it on. They had good clean technique. They had good clean technique. A shrug? Dude, a shrug's super simple. If you can't get him to pull right, you might want to go find a new job. And then squat jump. Split jerk and snatch. A little bit more complex. We need more technical work. So if I'm the VBT guy, Everybody knows me for VBT. I've got it on three to five exercises out of my whole weekly microcycle. Why then do you think everybody would want to be going and doing more? Whatever you do, don't go to extremes, whatever it happens to be. Some new fad is going to come out. Some new tool is going to come out that might be very, very useful. People have a tendency to go all the way to the extremes with it whenever we should really be sitting down here in the middle. Okay. Now... We're not going to talk about this because I'm running low on time. How does it work? Whenever you get down to it, velocity-based training is always going to be effective. It is always going to be effective for this reason right here, that it, the f immediate feedback. It's instantaneous and objective. It doesn't care who the person is. Now, we also have to realize that this generation of, you know, you get to this 35 years and up. We had, man, we had Atari. You could only play Pitfall and Frogger for so long, and we were back outside looking to you know, have a good time. Nowadays, the kids, dude, freaking you know, NCAA, Madden and all that stuff, uh, Legend of Zelda and, and all that, and all these other video games, kids will sit in front of those for hours, right? All they think about is the high score. They want to set the high score. They want to set the high score. Use that to your advantage. It gives you a number in velocity or power. You can simply go with either one of those, and the athlete intrinsically is going to try and beat their last score, and they're going to try and beat their opponent's score, their teammate's score, whoever's on the platform with them. And it leads to a lot of jack jawing, and it leads to a lot of greater intended effort. And it's all about intent. Okay, velocity helps to create intent. It doesn't matter what the tool is. Velocity helps to create intent. It gives feedback, right? Uh, I say it serves as another coach on the floor, and this is often misleading for people. It's another coach on the floor because it helps you to dictate what load needs to be done. It doesn't coach form. 
You coach the form, you allow it to dictate the load. So never take your eyes off of the athlete. Form first, velocity second, load third. After they're already strong. Now, this is a study I want to spend a minute on. Okay, this is from Randall et al. Effects of instantaneous feed, uh, performance feedback during six weeks of VBT on sports-specific performance tests. They took two groups of professional rugby players. They were professional athletes. Why do I want to bring that up? Well, right here. Oh, okay, let's go over the protocol. They did the exact same sets, the exact same reps, the exact same exercises, and the exact same loads. One thing varied between the two groups. One group received the feedback of velocity on just their squat jumps, and the other group received no feedback of velocity. Okay? Now let's look here. Vertical jump, 4.6 to 2.8%. Feedback one. Horizontal jump, 2.6 to 0.5. Velocity one. And dude, this is six weeks. 5% increase on vertical in six weeks in a pro athlete. That shouldn't happen, right? They're the cream of the crop. They're at the top of what they should be doing. But we're getting these kind of numbers out of it. And we're getting these kind of numbers out of it by simply giving the feedback of velocity and not changing a thing at all to the program. Okay? Think about that. If you wanted to make your program more effective, all you have to do is give them the feedback of velocity on certain key exercises. Don't do it on everything. It takes too long. You know, and some things aren't made to be hard. Right? If you've got an exercise for mobility, what happens if you throw velocity on top of it? You're probably going to mess something up. Right? How do I know? Because I've tried it and I like tweak stuff. Don't do it. The sprint, velocity was far better. Okay? In professional rugby athletes, this is not in novices, guys. This is why it's always important to go beyond the abstract. Okay? It's important to go beyond the abstract. It doesn't say anything about pro athletes up here, does it? In that title. You have to go through the methods and look at the subjects to see that. Okay, let's, I know I've talked a little bit too long at the start, so we're just going to, to rip through here. For the feedback, I use velocity. Why do I use velocity? Because of the zones and I know what stuff is supposed to be. You can absolutely use power. That's perfectly fine. All right? you, but use whatever you want. I like velocity because it's simpler numbers and I can remember it. I can remember it. I can remember two-digit things. When you start getting out to four digits, you know, I'm done. And while it might be different for the professionals, uh, you know, that, that you guys are working with, uh, my athletes, man, whenever you use your head as a battering ram, you know, some, some things, and, you know, not to, just to mention that we're not necessarily getting the brightest guys in there in the first place, that uh, a lot of the enhanced learning plan kids, so the smart kids go to track, the, the other kids, you know, they got to have the, the GPA on the track team to offset the GPA on the football team a lot of times, it seems. Now, different lifts have got different velocities. And like I had said earlier, that we've got you know, the clean and the snatch. They move at far greater velocities. Than, uh, so we can't just give it just some, some random range. And that'll even vary by height, too. I don't know if I put it in here for the peaks, because I've actually gone to peak. But we, uh, uh, these are the mean velocities for it. Clean pull, snatch pull, hang power snatch, hang power clean. We can see that they're very different. Now, uh, I just want to point out that these clean pull velocities right here, this is for when you're trying to overload the movement, okay, whenever you're trying to just really go all out and get like that major neural, neural stimulus. That's whenever you'd be doing the pulls like this. Otherwise, I'd probably just stick with those velocities too. Okay. Now, on a side note, and I didn't include a second point here, but I'll go ahead and do it. Uh, I've got a peak velocity for Olympic lifts, and I've done it for a couple of reasons. Well, for the first is that a lot of our subjects, a lot of our athletes had orthopedic issues, okay? And I'm sure that knowing the tactical operators that I know, everybody's got a jacked up shoulder, back, knee, elbow, wrist, something is jacked up. Well, that is going to influence the way the movement is done. If you have an Olympic lifter, there is a perfect relationship between mean and peak velocity. That is their sport. That is what they do. You have an athlete in any other sport, one, their technique doesn't seem to be as perfect, so it doesn't quantify, right? And one of the things that uh, I, you know, I'm going to be completely honest, my athletes, I only pull them. I never go into the catch position. Why do I never go into the catch? Guys, that's another sport in and of itself. There's guys that spend 20, 30, 40 hours a week doing just Olympic lifts to refine their technique. 
So if we're trying to improve their technique on Olympic lifts to be perfect to enhance their sports skill, then that Olympic lifter better be able to go out there and sink 10 out of 10 free throws. But it ain't going to happen because it's a different sport. So I prefer to spend more time developing sports skill than I prefer to uh, catching the Olympic lift, the very, very technical portion of it. You can learn how to pull in about five minutes, right? And you, preemptive to that, you can do kettlebell swings and med ball throws, get the same, same stimulus. Now, another thing that I've gone to for a uh, reason why I've gone to the peak velocity on Olympic lifts is that there was a study that came out in 2014 for Herbili et al. where they looked at Olympic lifters uh, on the clean and the snatch, I believe it was, it looked on both. And they found that peak velocity happened at the top of the second pull. So if we know when peak velocity occurs and we know what peak velocity should be, and we know that the average velocity is the average from the start to the end of the movement, which orthopedic issues and other things can slow the bar down so you can catch it because of the pain. Go with peak. Just go with peak. It's the signal and the noise. Let's eliminate all the other noise, and let's just go with the signal. And the signal on the Olympic lifts is clear with peak velocity. Here's some stuff that I've been doing for 1RM. These are 1RM velocities, peak velocities for the snatch the clean and the jerk. And you'll notice there's a pretty wide spread, and that should actually be 2.85 rather than uh, 2.35, my apologies. I have got fat fingers, apparently, okay? Uh, 1.45 to 1.85, 1.38 to 1.8. The spread is so wide because of height, right? Height, a six foot six, six foot eight guy is gonna be going a lot faster than a five foot six guy, okay? Uh, it's just simple physics, greater distance, you know, distance divided by time is velocity. If you've got to go to a greater distance, you're going to be needing to achieve a greater velocity for that load to go up to that greater height. Because gravity is pulling, pulling back down on you at 9.8 meters per second. So it's a longer time you've got to fight gravity. Uh, if you want to buy the individual heights, you've got huge ranges in your, your uh, subject, your, your athletes, your operators. Uh, there's an article I wrote on simplyfaster.com that, that outlines that. Okay. Now, uh, Basically, here's all that I'm trying to show in these next few slides, is that if we were looking at, uh, we can predict the bar speed, the percentage of 1RM by what the speed is and vice versa. You know that you want to be going at 75% of 1RM, you can throw it into this equation on a bench press by uh, the study of Jadovsev, uh, Harris, no idea, and Cronin. Uh, I'm not even going to try that one. You can use that equation and you got it. Right? And you've got it very accurately. How do we know? Because that light gray, that's a standard deviation. Here's all the studies for that. Okay? Three different studies. Look how close it is to that line. Velocity and load, percentage of 1RM, are a very, very linear relationship. Okay? Uh, you, can utilize, you can predict 1RM on any given session. On any given session. Because of that concrete relationship. All you've got to do is know what the terminal velocity should be, what the cutoff should be. Okay, for a bench press, it's 0.12 to 0.8 on average. I've seen, you know, if you're power lifters, okay, and this, is, this stuff is on average. And I know what we talk about with averages, right? We know the old statistics joke where the st statistician had his head in the oven and his feet in the freezer and said, on average, I feel pretty normal. You're going to have some freaks, and you're going to have to adjust for the freaks. That's the downside of the zones. The freaks, though, represent about 3% of your population. So I'll adjust for 3%, and I'll leave everybody else the same. And I know what somebody's going to say. Well, then you've got a bottom 3%. Guys, I don't care about the bottom 3%. They're not going to keep me a job, right? You know, you've got studs and duds. Your studs, focus your time on. Your duds, they're probably going to quit anyways. So don't waste, I, I don't waste my time. Does that sound bad? Does that sound inhuman? Guys, this is how you keep your job. This is how you keep your job at Division I over in, in college. Maybe a little bit different for the tactical operator, right? Because somebody might not be able to jump, but by God, they can shoot a, a hair off of a rabbit at 2.5 miles and just bam, and get it done. I, I understand it's a completely different skill set. But if you want to throw in some uh, velocity, so let's say you've got uh, Jim Aware and some of the accelerometer units. They do have this uh, function on there for their 1RM prediction. Unfortunately, most of them just put in 0.15 as a default. Well, guess what? That's going to be too fast for some, too slow for others. Bench press, it's fine. 0.15 for a squat or a trap bar deadlift, it might give you an extra like 50, 100 pounds on there. 
right? That, you know, you'll, you'll look at that. There's, there's no way. I've had uh, some you know, professional team call me up and like, man, these numbers are way off. I asked them to open up, the, uh, open up their file, go to this number, double click this, change that to 0 0.32. Oh, no, then that looks exactly what I think it should look like. So, you know, just make sure that you've got those set and you're good, okay? Uh, this is my personal data. What I want to try and show here is that this is the first I had trained the whole time after my, uh, I had worked out, let me say this. I had, from the day my daughter was born, I kept working out. We know that if anybody has had an infant before, there are some uh, major stressors there going on. The crying, the pooping, the crying, the crying all night. It plays with you. So this was the first workout that I came back with. Uh, we see that I go up to 290 pounds. I got a 0.44 at 290. My velocity predicted 1RM comes out to about 335.7 pounds. Okay? Uh, I put in 0.15 because I know good and dang well that's my 1RM speed. Here I am August 22nd. So this is right before that happened. We see that my predicted 1RM is 396. So in about six weeks, I dropped 60 pounds off of my bench. Okay? Why? the other stressors that we've got going on in our lives. Stress is systemic. Okay, now what I want to try and show at this table, basically, is that there's this concrete relationship between velocity and percentage of 1RM. Uh, we look here, let's just look at 60%, because I can see that one quite clearly. 0 0.80 on the pre-test, 0.79 on the post-test. This is after they gain 10% of their strength, okay? We see that it's concrete. Whatever the speed is, that's the, that's the percentage of 1RM you are at that, that day. I know if I'm moving eight, uh, 0.8 meters per second, it's 60%. Okay, it doesn't matter if I'm moving 200 pounds that day or if I'm moving 260. Good day, bad day, or normal day, good day, bad day, 135, right? Again, we look at other studies. This is their relationship on bench press. Why are all the studies done on bench press? Because this is the greatest exercise in the world. I'm damn good at it. That's why. Here's an equation you can utilize, again, to look at percentage of 1RM and velocity. These are in the slides that you guys have, so we're just going to blast through that. Let's blast through this. This is the outside stressors, though. I want to go ahead and point a second out for this. Uh, we see that this, uh, this dashed line is the pre-tested 1RM. This is for a rugby athlete, a professional rugby athlete uh, down in, in Australia. Uh, then we look up here, we see velocity predicted 1RM for any given day. We see some days they're right on. Some days that number would be way too high, right? Some days the number would be way too low. I would always rather be lucky, uh, right than lucky. I'm not lucky. I know that good and damn well. Hopefully Dr. Alvar can change my luck. But right now I know that I'm not a lucky individual. I would rather be right. So utilizing velocity, I know exactly where we are in any given day and I can adjust the load. What happens on a day whenever we're down here and I give him 90% of 1RM. It's way too heavy. He could get hurt. What happens on these days when I give him 90% of 1RM? It's too light. I'm not getting the stimulus that I'm expecting. Okay? But if I go with velocity, it's like, uh, you know, it's the, the little bear. You know, it's just right. The porridge was just right. The bed was just right. The, I don't remember what else there is in that nursery rhyme, but I'm sure within the next year I will know that very well. Uh, the velocity. What, here's what I'm trying to just show here. Uh, here's what I do with velocity-based training now. I don't do velocity on everything. I do it for three reasons. One, I use it for power work, strength, speed, and speed strength. The other thing I use it for is only a cutoff, right? A cutoff. Like, I know that I don't want my strength work being below this speed. And the third thing that I do it for is for velocity loss. And looking at the velocity loss, I like to go with the 10% or less because that maintains the highest quality. And we'll go over that here very, very shortly, okay? Uh, right now, matter of fact. So the velocity loss, higher quality of work, it allows for selective hypertrophy. You guys remember Werner Gunther, the great Swiss shot putter, realized that he only had 37% of type 2 fibers. 37% of him was fast twitch, 63% was slow twitch, whenever you look at the number of fibers. However, with his training, he switched that. He actually had 70% of his cross-sectional area was type 2. How did he do that? If you watch his training, you know exactly how he did it because every single thing was explosive, okay? There might have been some other things that were going on at that too because of the years that he trained. 
But hey, if it's legal, I would have been doing it too. All right, what I'm basically trying to show here is that if we look at this 20% velocity loss, man, that's small. Basically, what I want to look at and show you is that with that 20% velocity loss, they actually lost a little bit of cross-sectional area, okay? Not fibers. They lost cross-sectional area, okay? 38.9 to 37.9. We look at our type 2, uh, two A's went from 39.4 to 43.8. So but just by giving that higher quality of work, they increased the cross-sectional area of the type 2 fiber, decreased it to the type 1. This is a great way to do selective hypertrophy. Go with high quality of work, okay? Uh, let's go ahead and let's hit this, and then I'm going to go into the, the accelerometer thing because I, I feel that's really important with the population you guys are with. You want to go off the beaten path. It's like, I don't squat, I don't bench, I don't do deadlift, I don't do Olympic lifts. This stuff means nothing for me. Well, actually, it still could because you think you don't do that because it doesn't transfer to you. Okay, that's great. Uh, pick something that, that does. Okay, squat. Maybe it doesn't transfer to you. But on the crew, they do the bench row, rowing. They do that bench row, and that, that's fantastic for them. It's a key performance indicator. How do you do it for those? The same way that you do it for an individual. Okay. If I'm looking one-on-one -on -one stuff, which unfortunately I'm not going to get into because I don't have time, I talk too long, my fault, uh, here's what I do. Whenever I'm looking at a special exercise, I perfect technique. First you perfect technique and you get them strong in that movement. Then you take them up to a heavier, heavy-ish load and you find where did peak power occur. Use that velocity for the peak power for that individual on that exercise. Add on a quarter of a meter per second for speed strength. Take off a quarter meter per second for strength speed. And you've got an individualized load. Some people like to just go with the weight at which peak power occurred. I disagree with that. Why do I disagree with that? You saw that graph, how it went like this, way up, way down, et cetera. That's not taking into account the person's nervous system on that given day. Okay? So I look at the velocity instead. Okay, now, utilizing a non-LPT. So if you're doing LPT here and accelerometer the other, you can do it one of two ways. The first is that you can currently do force velocity profile, I'm sorry, velocity profiling, force velocity profiles or something different. This, is, uh, this would be for a whole other talk. Do your velocity profile, use both instruments. You'll get on average what the, the speed should be on the accelerometer, you'll get it on the LPT, and then you could give you know, the exact prescription for either one, okay? Or, you know how we just talked about doing it for special exercises? Take the accelerometer, find their peak power, and go from there, and leave everything else alone, okay? And just find that velocity at which they got peak power. Downside, you've got to make sure that you're dealing with a great instrument. A lot of people get sucked in because something is super cheap. You know, my, uh, my first boss, Rick Perry, is now with the Chicago Bears. He's got a saying that uh, good meat ain't cheap and cheap meat ain't good. You know, there's another saying, buy nice or buy twice. If something's 150 bucks and the rest of the market is 1,000 bucks, it's probably a reason why it's 150 bucks, right? Now, sometimes that's something you're willing to, de willing to deal with. Sometimes it's not. Okay, uh, let's go on, basically with individuals, guys, with individuals, I just do that velocity profile like I just spoke about. Okay, you just go up and wait, go up to their 1RM, and you know exactly where their 1RM cutoff is, and everything else is going to be in a straight line. Okay, and then you can assign the velocity to the percentage of 1RM for that one individual. Why do I not do that? It takes too long. If I'm dealing, you know, at University of Missouri, we had 534 athletes. Do you guys have time to do that for 534 people? It's very, very time intensive. Okay. The zones, you know, I, and I use the zones because Andy, Lar, uh, Andy Fry at uh, KU has talked to me before and he said he's got this thing he calls the TLAR method. Okay. The TLAR is that looks about right. The velocity zones line up with the percentage of 1RM, guys. It lines up perfectly. And it does a very good job. If you saw the R squareds, they were over 0.9, you know, usually around 0.98. So if 98% of the time it works like that, I ain't going to mess with it. However, we do have freaks, right? We had a guy that's playing in the NFL, doing quite well, extremely explosive. Where we saw that 1RM for bench was 0.15 to 0.18, 0.12 to 0.18. He was 0.47. 
it was either extremely fast or it wasn't there at all. We had to adjust for him. The studs you adjust for, the duds, I didn't waste my time. So uh, I want to go on to my contact info here. Oh, let's talk about this really quick. I went from right here in Springfield, Missouri, to down here to Phoenix, Arizona, with a map, McNally's Atlas. Some of you people in here might be too young to know what an atlas is. So it's this book of maps, right? And if you knew where you were, and you knew where you were going, and you knew what was around you, you could get from point A to point B. I went from 2700 South Ingram Mill Road, apartment number 18, to 18th and Indian School Road. Yes, Brent, I lived in the hood there. Helicopters going over at night. Did, I only got lost one time. I got lost one time because I had been driven for 18 and a half hours. I decided to turn around, and I thought instead of busting a UE, I was going to do it legal and go down one road, come back over, and come back up the next. I was wrong. GPS. Interesting side story about GPS. My wife's stepdad was one of the people that invented it. Right? He's, a, he's a, what I would call a, a no-crap rocket scientist. That that's, you know, he, he actually has a bumper sticker that says, yes, actually, I am a rocket scientist. And he told me that if you have clear skies, GPS is accurate within three feet. Okay, that's why Glo they, uh, uh, some of the companies went to GLONASS that uses more satellites and can get it down to like a foot and a half or something like that. But I can use my phone and go out there, no. Doot, 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 oh, need to turn right here. Oh, I need to turn left here. Uh, I know exactly whenever I need to turn. Percentage-based training is the map, guys. It is very effective. It has been around for years. You don't necessarily need velocity. Is it good to have? Is it a little bit more precise? If there is road construction, or if you aren't where you think you are, will that help you get where you need to go? Absolutely. But it is not, I'm not up here telling you, everybody in here must go buy this. No, nah, man. People have been setting world records with, a lot, with none of this stuff, right? You know, the hammer throw, the discus. NCAA record was set by Meg Stone back in the Stone Age. You know, that was, ref, uh, that was a bad joke in reference to her, her current last name. But Meg Ritchie, you'll see, she's still got it. Uh, whereas, you know, today we've got these things. Everything is very effective, guys. Uh, here's a bunch of my references at the last contact info. Uh, I've got business cards up here if you want them. Uh, there's my office number. Twitter, I get a lot of emails. I don't get very many tweets. I'm busy, but I'm not very popular. So if, some, if I don't get back to you in a couple of days, tweet at me, email me again, whatever it happens to be. Uh, now Mizzou has got some weird thing going on that uh, a lot of times the emails get blocked. So I might have to go through and put in your address to uh, allow some exception, something like, I, I don't get it. But it's, it's whatever it is. Or I'll give you my Gmail account, which is just simply jbryanman at gmail.com. It'll go through to there. All right, guys, so thank you for your time. I appreciate it.